and thank you for giving up your time on this lovely sunny day. I can see some people in clinical areas. They won't mind switching their cameras off purely because we're just a bit worried about connectivity. That would be great. Um, and just to sort of say, I'm Helen Hunt, for those that don't know me. I'm from the West Midlands Academic Health, um, Academic Health Science Network. A little nervous. <laughs> And we're just really proud and humble to be hosting this session. Um, I want to make, I want to say a big thank you for making time for yourselves and also for all the speakers in the whole series, in case I don't get a chance to say this, thank you for giving up their time to support us. So I suppose just to sort of start, um, Dan, do we want to do a check in anything off the chat? Can you see anything, any sort of themes before we get going? Already said the furthest is Belgium, um, isn't it? The furthest is definitely Belgium, Jan. So uh, thank you. Got in Indonesia. Oh, nice. Right. So let's start with um, what's going to happen today. So I'm just going to do a really quick introduction as host, and then hand over to Dan, who's going to talk you through a bit of appreciative inquiry in his journey. And then we're going to hand over to the lovely Alison Jones that's going to take you on her journey and we will be done for four o'clock or if we go over we'll just see where it goes um so why are we doing this just a little bit about my story and why we're here uh, i was redeployed into my host organization hospital at the start of the pandemic um, which is a large a extremely large trust in Birmingham here in the West Midlands and that was to help operationally with patient flows and to support the senior, senior response clinicians. Oh, is that all right? I could hear some feedback then. And during that journey it was quite frankly I was hearing stories, hearing statistics that were really scary and then sort of each night I'd come back and phone Dan and just kind of have a bit of coaching and mentoring about reframing and the processes and what I'd seen and just putting it into sort of a narrative. And then we just sort of said to each other, why aren't we doing this for everyone? Because if I'm feeling it, there's going to be lots of others. And we spoke to Alison and we just like, let's do a webinar series. And here we are, simples. Not that Sarah would agree as she turned it around in a week. So just a little bit more about those um, sort of eight weeks that I was working in the hospital and my reflections were that I went into support we'd agreed as a family yet yeah, let's do this let's go and help whatever way I can and on the first day I was walking to the major incident room which by the way even those words just fill me with dread major incident room but that's exactly what it was and that's exactly what I was walking into and I found the familiar sounds and smells that my senses have become accustomed to after working in this hospital for 20 years just to sort of add that in they weren't there and it felt like I was a stranger in a new city and I felt like an imposter because I'm not a clinician and I thought what am I doing here am I going to be in the way what am I going to be doing am I going to be helpful and I think that's a whole AI webinar series in itself I might add and I'm walking to the hospital and I'm coming up to the rotating doors that are no longer rotating due to social distancing, which actually could be reframed as a positive because I always cause them to stop, you know, when you walk too soon. And then there's a long row of hand sanitizers that are cleverly positioned that you can't access the, hand, the hospital until you've washed your hands. And then when you get into the hospital, there's always this beautiful, comforting smell of coffee from Costa. And the sound of the barista banging the, I had to look this up, it's actually called a porter filter. But that banging that you always hear, it wasn't there. And suddenly it hits me that this is different, this building's different and it felt significant. My familiarity had disappeared. And then I suddenly realized how important that was to me, to comfort me. But then I came around and saw, oh, the sights and sounds that I'd never really noticed as I said, worked in this hospital for 20 years, like the fruit stall that's by the main entrance and the smell of strawberries because he had absolutely loads of punnets of strawberries. And I wouldn't normally see or smell those because I'd be rushing to the next meeting, often late. And I'd notice the man going about selling his fruit with a big smile in the middle of a pandemic, offering staff a bit of banter while they've got all their PPE on. And I just thought, how lovely, just that moment. 
then at the end of the shift, there's lots that goes on in the shifts, but then towards the end and I'm walking to my car, I just heard the generators of this huge, massive hospital that I realised these generators are what keep this hospital alive. Never heard them before because normally what you'd have is the ambulance sirens, the helicopter landing, the queue of traffic trying to get home late for the school run. Normally I'm in that queue. And then this hum I realise as I'm walking, it's helping me regulate. And now I'm part of actually a new team with people I've never met before, but that doesn't matter because we're connected and I felt safe. And I think it's a really important sort of word to say. And then one last sense that I sort of want to talk about um, is music. So how other people feel is that music's playing a really big part for me. Often it's playing because I've got a 16 year old daughter, but I'm actually listening now and it brings up a lot of mixture of memories and um, feelings. And so, for example, whenever I hear, this is for you, Suzanne, whenever I hear Black Eyed Peas, I've got a feeling it takes me straight to Nice last year at the World Appreciative Inquiry Conference with Emma Plunkett, Suzanne, Belinda Dwar, and we got the whole room up doing a flash mob. And I think, God, that was only 12 months ago and the world's so different now. So then I started thinking, actually, when I look back, what song is going to trigger all the pandemic for me? And I sort of asked you guys that and perhaps use the chat on the side. What music or sound or what song do you think is going to trigger that for you? And then for me, it does sound really cliche, but our neighbours are um, part of the Salvation Army and every Thursday night they come out for the clap for carers and they play some music and then they always sort of end with somewhere over the rainbow. And I think that's what's going to do it for me because it's become that routine. Well, I really wanted to share a little bit of my uh, journey, so I'm just going to sort of check in with Dan if there's anything off the chat. I really wasn't reading as I went along. So Suzanne loves the fact, um, the poignantness of your story, but yes to music. So I'd really welcome others to share what songs are really connecting with them at the moment in the chat. People loving the Black Eyed Peas at the minute. Certainly. He's on Twitter somewhere. Dan, you'll have to retweet that out, won't you? Yeah. <laughs> so that leads nicely to hand over to you, Dan. Okay, so I'm going to start sharing my screen. So I know a few of... Someone's trying to ply the black RP now, which is great. <laughs> Whilst we're going through this, if we could ask you just to turn off your um, cameras and mute yourselves, that would be really great. Certainly for those of you that have just come in, just because it helps with some of the bandwidth in terms of recording so that we don't get that feedback. Um, so in terms of appreciative inquiry, at the start of this, some of you said that your knowledge or expertise is very varied. Some of you have varied levels. So I just want to take you through. So I'm Dan Hodgkiss. I work for the Academic Health Science Network in the West Midlands. And I'm going to explore a little bit of what gives life and what's giving life at the moment. Um, and please feel free to tweet um, during and after the session. And there's a few Twitter handles there, certainly the HSN and the patient safety, etc. Right, so appreciative inquiry. So Appreciative inquiry I found many, many years ago, and it was something that I studied in university and then started using it in my time in the council, but never really associated that I was doing appreciative inquiry, if, if that's what we call it. So many times in healthcare, it, it could be that we're already using it. So don't associate it to be that. And appreciative inquiry is very different in the sense that it's an asset based approach and it looks to what gives life. So it looks for how we inquire more into what's going on around us and then how we build the best that we want from our organizations and use strengths to build the best version of ourselves or an organization or a team or your family, etc. Because for me, appreciative inquiry extend to work. It is used when it becomes part of you and is used then at home life and in um, work life as well and, and the more that you engage with it and use it the more fluent and easier it becomes for you because it's not easy when we start looking at strengths so if I was to ask the question now 
how many of us could identify our top three strengths. Some of us would struggle with that. Some of us, when we see a SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, we'll look straight away at the weaknesses and fill the box, but the strengths we leave till last. And that's a real shame because all of us have those strengths that we don't always get to hear. Um, and equally, that we don't always get to talk about. But actually, appreciative inquiry asks us to start having conversations, telling stories, and how we ask questions differently to generate more strengths from that. So appreciative inquiry, David Cooper, I did in a recent paper that looked at appreciative inquiry in the broken world, talks about appreciative inquiry on three levels. The first is the easiest in my understanding and lots of practitioners who use appreciative inquiry is that appreciative inquiry in the extraordinary. And learning from learning from excellence is a real example of that. You know, where we look for excellence in health and social care. And then we look to learn from that and inquire further into that. Because we're taking the time to look at something that works well. As opposed to something that hasn't worked at all. And we know traditionally in healthcare that there can be a focus at times, certainly in health, social care as well, that focus on the negative. So where there's serious incidents or complaints, it's quite easy to let the body pull down that we see those weaknesses and not focus on the extraordinary. But actually there's been a big movement, certainly in the UK and stretching wider now across Europe into the movement of learning from excellence, how we celebrate what gives life to excellence. The next sort of step on that pyramid is appreciative inquiry in the ordinary. And that's where it gets a little bit more difficult because that's allowing us to make the mundane marvelous. And by doing that, that we have time to look at those things that we can take for granted and really think about how they inspire us or how they motivate us to move further forwards. And a real nice example of that is artists. And certainly one that I thought about, hence my picture of a sunflower, is Van Gogh. So Van Gogh took a simple vase of sunflowers and turned them into something that has inspired for decades. And actually, that's where we get that sense of mindfulness of moving us forwards along our journey. However, we're in a space at the minute, which is appreciative inquiry in the tragic. And that's COVID, the pandemic. And it's quite easy at this point to stop using appreciative inquiry or stop looking at our strengths. And this is the time that I would suggest that we need to focus a lot more on strengths. So. Victor Frankl talks, he was an Aust Austrian prisoner of war in World War Two. And he everything was taken away from him and those around him. And actually, it was quite a desperate situation to be in a concentration camp in World War Two. Not knowing where your next meal's coming from. Or not knowing if you're going to be alive to see your family again. And Victor talks really emotionally in his book that he wrote in 1959 about how he started to see relationships forming. How he started to see that every resource that he hung on to was something that inspired him and gave him strength. And he talks very much about what it is to give life, but we must evidence burning. And that's a really poignant statement if you think about that. So that burning of the pandemic at the minute, but giving us life to innovate, to create, to move forwards. And a little bit about my journey. So in healthcare, um, I spent a lot of years focused in local government and children's services, working a lot with child protection, which again can be the tragic. 
especially where you think about the, the stories. And for me, when I joined healthcare, the trust that I joined was an acute community trust that had a recent CQC inspection that looked at inadequate. And I know to those of you in health and social care, really poignant that CQC for the moment has gone away. So it's language that we've almost forgotten. You know, um, but equally, we were faced with an inadequate writing a trust that had gone into special measures and a governance team that I was part of in patient safety that was almost non-existent and focused solely on the things that go wrong. So how do we try to move forwards and learn from anything that goes wrong, much like a serious incident? And what we did was over sort of three years, create a little bit of a revolution there and say that actually this is not the sort of governance that we want to be associated with. There's always going to be a place to learn from incidents and complaints and how we learn from deaths altogether. But equally, how do we learn from when it all goes right? Or how do we allow that conversation to even enter our lives or the spice at work is certainly in governance and nursing and, and surgery, etc. How do we allow that conversation to what gives life to us working well? And in that, there's that sense that we changed the way we engaged on the front line. We took governance to the front line because we knew that the front line didn't have time to go to training, didn't have time to, you know, come out to us and, and understand that real sense of learning. And fast forward from 2015 to 2018, the patient safety team that I was part of, and I know some of my Colleagues are on the call, so Julie, Alex, Aisha, and we'd work tirelessly to change that. And equally then to look at where we were going. By 2018, we won a national HSJ award for the best risk and compliance team in the country from a team that was faced with inadequate. And I think that's where we can use that appreciative inquiry in the tragic to really inspire us, to really move us forwards of how we want to look at strengths as an approach. So I, I've given you hopefully a few images during that story. And these are some of the images that we're seeing at, at the minute. You know, lots and lots of those rainbows, lots of the sharing hands and holding hands, especially where patients or residents relatives can't join. And actually that resident or that patient in intensive care doesn't feel as, as motivated, but actually a nurse or a doctor or a carer holding their hand is really powerful. So I want you just to explore for the next couple of minutes in the chat function, what images are giving you strength at this current time? So take a couple of minutes to add to the chat. So Helen, if we can just take a few snapshots of anything that's coming through. Yeah, we've got um, angel guides, we've got praying hands and emojis, um, rainbows, um, gardens, blue skies, our oh, pictures of family, absolutely. It's amazing actually how they're just flowing away. People don't have to overthink it at all. And actually, you know, you think about that poignant clap every Thursday for our carers and our health workers and our shop workers, you know, and you think about that. And I remember the very first clap. So I'm a healthcare worker, not frontline remote working. And I had this sense of being a healthcare fraud, fraud if you like. You know, that I'm remote working, I'm not frontline. I'm moving from one webinar to the next webinar and actually feeling what's my contribution. And one of my friends texted me at the first clap and said, Dan, I've just clapped for you. And I said, please don't clap for me because I'm not at the front line. 
And they said, no, but every health and social care worker is adding value. And that really started to reframe me at that point in time. And I know I've had conversations with Joel, dear, my line manager, and we've had really nice conversations about how we both felt that at times. And even within our team, we've shared that frustration at times. So this series for me is one of those why is that we're giving something back. You know, that you don't have to be at the front line. You don't have to be remote working and feeling guilty. It's okay, actually. But we're all in it together. So then we come on to our language and our narrative that we create. And some of these have come from the Cooper Rider Center of Appreciative Inquiry. So I really love that um, one of those was that we hear constantly, constantly at the minute, we're socially distancing. Well, actually, we beg the question, really, are we socially distancing or are we physically, physically distancing but socially connecting now more than ever. So I have calls and by the end of the day, my voice, is, my throat's a little bit sore because I'm talking so much now to friends and relatives, etc., and people that I've not spoken to in years asking how we are. And that's powerful. To think then equally about those strange and scary times to reframe and flip what we're saying into clarifying times, because actually we're clarifying lots. Lots of innovation and creativity at the minute. That sense of where did it go? Where did it all go wrong? And reframing that even beyond COVID to where did it all go right? So how do we move forward from serious incidents, compliance, etc.? To where did it go right in healthcare? Because as we know, 90% of the time, it goes as expected or better than expected in health and social care. And we forget that. We focus 90% of the effort on the 10% that goes wrong usually. And then I had a chat with Aisha and Alex recently and we were talking about new norms and I really hate the term new norms. Um, and Alex said about Shakespeare at the time and this undiscovered country looking at the future. And I then reframed what Alex had said into undiscovered ordinary, because actually there's a lot of this that we will go back to our ordinary that give us comfort as our comfort blanket, but equally, there's a lot yet that we're still to discover. And I think that sense of journey and forward thinking that we're on a quest to discover what will become ordinary for us. So, Helen, just at that point, anything else from the chat that we want to raise or any questions at this point? The one that made me giggle on the imagery was definitely the zoom icon, because I definitely hear that. Um, yeah, no, just a lot talking about um, their appreciating what you're saying about not being frontline and that guilt and some really great messages of support there, Dan, sort of saying a lot of people share those feelings, but actually we've all got a role to play. Um, language has come up about how we're saying frontline. So if we remember Belinda Dwar, mind our language, actually, what does the yeah. frontline mean? And I completely agree. So for me, we're going to explore in a minute with Alice and a lot more about language and the narrative that we use. But equally, then we'll look to the fourth session, which will be a community of discovery where we start to co-create what those undiscovered ordinaries will become for us in health and social care. But before handing over to Alice, and I just want to finish on a story that encapsulates where I started in healthcare. So my transition from local government to healthcare came as a result of this story, and it's one that I live by ever since. So a man was walking down the beach, and in the distance he saw a lad bending down, but he couldn't quite see what he was doing. So he got closer to the lad and asked him, what are you doing? And the lad responded that there were, the surf is up and the tide's going out. This beach is full of starfish. And if I don't throw them back in, they'll die. For that, the man laughed. And he said, don't be silly. There are miles and miles of beach and hundreds and hundreds of starfish. You cannot make a difference. For that, to which the lad picked up a starfish and threw it into the surf and said, I just made a difference to that one. 
And I started in healthcare by looking at a child protection suite in my local hospital that we called the Starfish Suite and is muralled around the suite with the story of the starfish. And when you get closer to the imagery, there are images of starfish and fish that young children had drew that were on a child protection register that had seen so much abuse in their lives. And actually that room was then a completely different spice, not one of this physical assessment that's really quite hard and harrowing on a child, but something that changed the lens. So I'd ask us all to focus on the lens of positive narrative and the lens of celebration. And to that, I'm gonna hand over to Alison. Hello there, thanks very much, Dan, for that. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'd just like to, first of all, say a big thank you to Helen and Dan for organising this and this opportunity. Um, I know that there are lots of friends out there in the group. I can't see any of you, but I'm just imagining that I'm talking to you over a nice cup of tea or a beer or something. Um, so I'm going to enjoy doing this. Um, and of course, my thanks to the Learning from Excellence team for all of the experiences that have um, brought me to this. So thanks, Dan, for those slides. Great. Okay, so I guess the question that we're addressing today is, can appreciative inquiry help in difficult times? And of course, we would say yes, but more specifically, it is um, in the questions that we choose to ask, the language that we choose to use, the events and emotions that we choose to focus on, and the lens through which we perceive the world. And um, I'm sure you'll notice that, that the emphasis there is on on the element of choice. And I think in these very, very trying times, um, when so much seems to be out of control, this is a very good way of actually give, get, gaining back some control and um, making a choice about the way that we want to um, view our experiences and create um, our future going forward. So today I'm going to focus on um, another central tenet of appreciative inquiry, which is storytelling or the power of our narrative. And I just want to make a quick distinction here between that and um, reflective practice, which has somewhat been hijacked, I think, in healthcare by our education and development um, processes. So I just want to reassure you that in the context of appreciative inquiry, nobody is going to come along and assess your story and tell you that somehow you're remembering it wrong or that your related emotions are somehow flawed. So um, it's not, um, it is definitely a reflective process of, of a type, but it's not that type of reflective practice. And I'm going to share something with you now that comes from Suzanne Quinney and Tim Flack of Appreciating People, who are actually uh, the team who've taught me most about appreciative inquiry over the last few years. And that is something called hope. So H-O-P-E, hearing other people's experiences. And um, so Equally, where you know we feel that we have an experience that we want to um, share um, and connect with somebody else with, then the value of being that listening ear for somebody else is absolutely crucial. And really, through all of time and history, human beings have always detailed and shared their experiences through storytelling. And in fact, because of this, our brains have evolved uh, to receive and assimilate information most easily in that format. So the easiest way for us to know and understand one another is to hear each other's stories. And Maria Siros said, um, what each of us has to say authentically and humbly about the way we have lived events inevitably resonates with someone somewhere. And as a consequence, both experiences have added meaning. 
So Dan, if you could put up this um, question slide for me. And um, so the question arises actually, which stories are we going to choose to focus on after this acute time of COVID-19? Because it's only the right stories that will elicit connection and emotion, stir our intellect, um, um, add to our values and engagement and motivation. And so I invite you all to have a look at these questions and reflect on whatever it is that you've been doing um, in work or at home during the time of COVID and ask yourselves what stories have you heard or been involved with that have added meaning and built capacity in your in your lives and these are the things that I'm so many of us have had this experience of having lots of red tape stripped away and changes and improvements being able to be taken forward and I guess um, rather than just taking that for granted or perhaps then slipping away when things become less acute if you can reflect in an appreciative way about what was good about that what worked then these are the quality and service improvements that we can take forward from, uh, from this time. Um, and then a second question, which is possibly a little bit more personal. Um, what are the stories that you've heard that elevate positivity and foster strength? And I think that's more to do with our own personal mindset, what brings us um, joy and strength in the context of so much um, sadness and hard work. So I'll leave you to add um, uh, some thoughts in the chat, if you don't mind, that's great. Thank you very much, Dan, for that. Um, so I'm going to um, give a little bit about my story now. So I have um, a background as an intensive care nurse but I haven't actually been registered for many years um, and with the onset of the pandemic my greatest wish was to re-register and join my colleagues at the front line to fight this dreadful virus and I just again will remind you that we do tend to use this kind of fighting combative talk um, in these scenarios um, but it soon became clear that I'd been away from the bedside for far too long to qualify for the expedited re-registration or the COVID register as they called it. And what I experienced at that time was a very strong sense of guilt, um, that I wasn't contributing in the best way that I thought I could. And I'm going to share, I noticed on the chat that people definitely um, sort of connected with that idea of guilt that Dan had mentioned before and there are several other examples that I can share with you. So one is for those uh, vulnerable healthcare professionals who are self-isolating at home um, and while their colleagues are having to pick up extra shifts or even in New Zealand where their whole story seems to be one of tremendous success but the healthcare professionals there were expecting as they called it a tsunami you know of patients and covid cases to come in and they never arrived and there's actually guilt around their good fortune over there or more simply perhaps for those people who are working in the intensive care units and in the emergency departments you know I don't feel like a hero. I'm scared. Okay. And we're hearing from psychologists that um, these particular types of survivor guilt are very prevalent in conversations with healthcare workers at this time. Um, many of us do feel a little bit ambivalent about the Thursday clapping. Um, and whilst we know that uh, we are in line for some serious cases of trauma and perhaps um, post-traumatic stress, that we have to pay attention to the stories of what other healthcare professionals are feeling too. And there's fear, there's guilt, there's anxiety. And it's my best hope that, you know, as colleagues and that also the applauding 
public will have enough uh, space to deal with the well-being issues that we have rather than the sound bites um, about you know the popular sound bites about the the most front end line of care um, okay so the question is what should we do with all of this guilt and perceived failure and the first thing I want to say is that if we didn't care then we wouldn't feel guilty and so I think we need to perhaps rebrand our guilt as a manifestation of our caring and that of course is an example of reframing which is something that we use a lot in appreciative inquiry um, best um, explained maybe by the glass half full glass half empty um, analogy and I've got some other examples from our time in Covid so um, long queues at the supermarket you know what a pain but actually, if you think about it, how very fortunate are we to live in a country that has supermarkets, basically a land of plenty um, and to have everything, even if it takes a little bit longer that we need. Or another one from earlier on in uh, the pandemic. Why is everybody buying toilet roll? You know, and it was a little bit amusing and a little bit mocking, but actually... The real question underlying that is how can we make sure that everybody feels safe and has everything that they need? So reframing our guilt and our other emotions um, is one way of uh, countering these emotions. And the second is um, the gratitude dividend, which I'm sure many of you will be familiar with. It works physiologically to improve well-being and stave off despair. So, for example, I haven't seen my parents for more than nine weeks. But, you know, I am so grateful that they have wonderful neighbours who are keeping an eye on them and making sure that they have everything that they need. And a very easy way for us to um, absorb this kind of gratitude dividend into our everyday is that when we lie down at night and maybe those niggling concerns, worries, fears, other things that come flooding in, it's, um, it's an active process to look back on your day and surface the three best things that have happened and um, that can kind of reset the thought flow in your mind and, and help you rest and relax. Um, and Diane Whitney actually said that surfacing the good is not an avoidance of reality, but actually the best way to improve reality. And so we're never gonna say it doesn't negate or ignore the fact that things are difficult um, but it encourages, encourages us to uh, focus our attention on the best of a given situation and therefore how we can expand that and the smaller steps that we can take um, to have more of that good stuff and more of those improvements. So, so often we dismiss the value of our own stories and tell the stories of what we are not. So I am not a registered nurse and I wasn't on the front line. Um, but we have to embrace uh, the conflict and complexity within our actual lived stories. And just this morning, my 10 year old son had um, a comprehension homework that was about mixed feelings. And um, I said to him, do you understand, you know, what mixed feelings means? And he said, oh, yes, I have lots of those. And I thought I listened with, you know, some trepidation uh, as to what he was going to say next. But he said to me, yes, mum, it's like lockdown is really great because we don't have to go to school. But. I miss my friends and people are dying. And I thought, my goodness, if only we could all express ourselves as freely and well as that, then we would hardly ever um, misunderstand each other. And so the idea that 
we're not going to feel one solid thing about this COVID experience, but that it's very conflicting and complex and confusing. And I think, again, embracing that um, is another another step towards uh, processing everything that's happening for us. So I'll tell you the story of what I did do during the acute phase of uh, the COVID at, at the children's hospital. So I wasn't able to be at the bedside, but I was in the what was known as the clean corridor. So I was helping uh, the nurses and the doctors and the radiographers and anyone who had to go into the isolation area don uh, their PPE kit and every single parent who through no fault of their own uh, you know were going through the worst time of their life their child had need of intensive care but all at the same time uh, there was ICU lockdown a global pandemic and so there are these layers and layers on top of ordinary fears that uh, are, are harbored by by families with critically ill children so I certainly hope that they felt my empathy and encouragement um, through our brief conversations in that corridor. Um, I found that being a runner and a helper, um, I could have perceived it as a fetch and carry task, but I know that in those weeks I was observing, I was serving, I was providing and I was learning and I'm extremely grateful for that experience. So I, I wrote a, a blog actually about that time which is available on the learning from excellence website and um i would just say that really we must cultivate an appreciation of who we are and the stories that we have lived um, show up to the situation as we can and bring our whole selves to the task whatever it is that you're doing you're making um, a valuable contribution um, and of course all of the best stories end with an invitation into the next chapter. So, Dan, if you would like to share that last slide for me. Um, so, again, um, we'd like to open this up to you to have a think. Um, maybe project, you know, and think as we do in appreciative inquiry, um, in six months time, what stories do you want to have been part of on the other side of this pandemic? And um, I invite you to think about what happened to you, um, enriched with how it made you feel, and those will not always be um, positive emotions, but in that context, I'd like you to think about um, who or what inspired you at that time and also what good has or could come of that experience. So thanks very much, guys, again, for this opportunity. And then I'll hand back to Dan um, to field any uh, questions there might be. Thanks very much. So just to pick up, Alison, on a few things that I saw in the chat to start the discussion, and by all means, if anyone, whilst you're thinking about those questions, wants to, in the next part of the discussion, please put your cam on if you feel comfortable and be welcome to hear your voice. Um, but just a few that I pulled out. So a real pertinent story that I, I connected with was from Karen Baldry that said that one of their physios has been making uh, wooden holding hearts for their patients, for their relatives, etc. And that's giving them life to do that for others that they care for. And then I think Rachel Matthews brings up a really pertinent point about is what is the right story or is there a right story to share and how do we know that that's been shared? And I've put in the chat a little bit around Maria Saros and expanding on that, that actually Maria's view is that our story is really pertinent to share, even when we feel the voice in our head syndrome, that next part of us saying, no, don't share it because their story is better than mine, or I don't have a story as good as that one. And all of our stories are really important. And equally, she cites that actually there will be somebody 
in the world at that time that needs to hear your story. Now, the challenge there is how do you know who needs to hear the story? And I think that's something that will get explored as the series moves through to the sort of next session and the, the sort of community of discovery, etc. Lots of people saying, I really like the, the notion of a glass half empty. This gives more room for wine. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and a real sense that compassionate leadership, caring, that sense of appreciation is something that is really important and pertinent for us. And, and people sharing this, the story of how it felt to see you on the road or helping, Alison, which is quite nice. So, what was that, sorry? So, some in the chat have offered that how nice it was to see you in the corridors. Oh, yes, that's nice. That yeah. gave them life at that time. Uh, yeah. Does anybody that wants to offer further discussion? Then, by all means. have asked on the chat, and I know Zoe, who's ZEPR, would like to share. Stop sharing so that we get to see. Um, Do you want to turn your mic off on even Zoe and be part of the discussion? There we go. Oh, hello. I didn't realise you meant now straight away. <laughs> <laughs> um, hi, Alison. Hi, all. Um, I'm not quite sure now. I've gone shy. Sorry. <laughs> OK, if you want to wait till a bit later. Um, yeah, does somebody else want to start? Unless you've got a question to ask me. <laughs> does, does somebody else want to go first? Um, I, was, I was actually going to just set, share something that I was writing, actually. Um, and that's just that um, when Alison was talking about the donning and doffing, um, at the children's, there was a moment when I was I witnessed somebody donning, um, and she was in charge of donning all the staff before they went went on to a ward, and it was a real honour to watch because she was just so she did it with such pride and such compassion, and you know she you know she said it's really important to me that I do this to help keep the staff safe, and then seeing the staff come out on the other side. Um, they worked in waves and after two hours they were released and they changed and they, then they were greeted by the doffing team who just again took such pride and care in looking after those staff and making sure they all doffed correctly and carefully um, and then the staff were sort of had their time where they did the non non-clinical but equally important things and also just had time to recuperate um, and just seeing all the rainbows on the wards for, I guess there are people here that haven't been in the clinical area for a long time, but it's just so touching to see all the rainbows and all the messages on the wards that some of the wards, it's almost like um, yeah, the messages are on the ward, laminate on the walls, laminated or hanging as bunting in some of the areas. And everywhere you go, there are just rainbows and messages from children, from family to staff, but also to patients who can't have visitors. Um, and it's just really beautiful to see. And also even at the Nightingale, I was at the Nightingale and there was a whole wall of posters of rainbows by the contractors children that had been sent in to all the NHS staff to thank them for everything they do so yeah thank you <laughs> that's a lovely story Zoe Alison you are on mute it's a bit of feedback if I'm on would anybody else like to share? I would, if that's okay. It's Leslie Goodburn. Um, 
Hi, so I work um, for NHS England, NHS Improvement, um, supporting provider organisations around patient experience. Um, and as part of that, we've got the Heads of Patient Experience Network, um, which is made up of Heads of Patient Experience. And, and what kind of happened in when the pandemic came along was much of the work that people would generally do every day sort of disappeared. So things like friends and family tests, all the national surveys were paused, complaints and pals were paused. And in some ways, the network felt like their job had sort of disappeared overnight and were kind of worried about the pandemic and, and how to take that forward. So the, the story really is of that network coming together and really sharing um, everything what really happened was one person would write a standard operating procedure around virtual visiting. It would get shared, it would get implemented, it would go through governance, it would change the logo on the top of the standard operating procedure. And in the last sort of seven or eight weeks, the frenetic activity that there's been in the network around that move from kind of quality, quantitative data, friends and family test surveys, reporting, um, SBC charts are suddenly really centred around what's important to people. So implementing the connected hearts, family liaison service, messages to loved ones. So we're actually kind of collecting messages to loved ones. People are emailing them through. Someone's putting them onto a card with the photographs, printing it off, laminating it and delivering it to patients. And it just really brings home, you know, what's important to people. So messages to loved ones, the family could, in theory, email the patient direct if the patient's well enough and has a device. But there's something about having a laminated piece of card that's come from family that you can reflect on. There's something about having the time to, to really digest what people are saying to you. There's something about patients taking phone calls, replying to texts, doing FaceTime. Um, something about patients kind of reassuring families that they are okay um, and families reassuring the patient that they're okay where they can't visit and obviously not for COVID patients who've been in ITU sedated because obviously that's a different scenario but it's just really brought home how, how we kind of do things because we do things and actually what's really important especially like messages to loved ones is the family sending it the person who's delivering it and pulling it together gets massive satisfaction from reading it and then the patient is really thrilled to have this message so it was just really to share the fact that how quickly people can come together and share things and do things that are person-centered and how we need to pause and not go back to that machine of quantitative data um, I'd just like to respond to that, if I may. Thank you very much. Um, so I, the thing I would add is that actually appreciative inquiry is an excellent way to investigate that good work. So, you know, see, seeking to find the best of a, of a situation. And, and when you describe what worked um, and what helped, then to sit down with your colleagues and ask questions like so what was it about that situation or us as a team that made that so successful you know when you investigate success you'll kind of consolidate those good changes and improvements and hopefully have a better chance of of, of the, the best bits being carried on and, and taken forward and i guess just to add to that leslie i think one, it was a compelling story, and I, I totally agree that we need to push forwards with this now and not revert back. Um, and lots in the chat about, you know, coming together, supporting families. And actually, something to be really proud of is the fact that that patient safety strategy nationally last June referenced safety too. Referenced the use of appreciative inquiry. So this was a national document that was guiding the way that we move forwards in the NHS in patient safety to move towards appreciative inquiry and I think now more than ever to find how we look to do that and embed that across the country it is really important so that we pick up stories like yours Leslie of how do we interact with families with relatives with other colleagues and other teams 
you know, other sort of care set settings. So a lot in the chat about thinking about allied health professionals, how care homes have rose to the challenge of COVID, you know, under challenging times and thinking about that whole setting of the healthcare economy and the health and social care economy. So looking at not just a patient get into that acute setting, but then linking right the way through. So how do we look at that seamless transition where we concentrate our efforts on that patient and their relatives and the colleagues at all given points? I'm kind of conscious that we're coming to the end of the session. So in a minute, I'm going to hand over to Helen um, to tell us about the second session. Um, I just want to say that each session, whether you are able to participate in all of them or that you're only able to see parts of them uh, to dip in and out. And we've tried to create the session so that they're standalone, but equally that they flow together. So the next session looks at frontline practice and by frontline, you know, those in care homes, those in um, acute and community settings of how we all work together and how we build on that notion of changing that narrative. To how we then build it in our everyday conversations. So how do we have caring conversations? How do we have conversations that are worth having? health and social care moving forward. So that's, and, and then moving and build into that of what gives us gratitude and what gives us pride at the minute. So we're gonna hear some nice case study examples in the second session around that um, from Caroline, um, Sally and Amanda that are gonna share their case studies. And that's gonna be hosted by Suzette Woodward. Um, so, Helen, if you just want to share how people can access that. So, yeah, as we speak, hopefully an email will be landing in your inbox with the link to book on. Um, we're going to be part of WebEx events, so it's going to be a much larger WebEx and we can have breakout rooms, so hence why it's different. And we have changed the, the timing slightly till 2 till 3 p.m. because we realise we clash with the national meeting. So hopefully that's um, conducive to everyone, but we will record it again. Um, and I just wanted to say a huge thank you for everyone contributing. Alison, Dan, Sarah and I had no clue how this was going to land. We didn't know if it was going to be empty, an empty chat box. So I'm just really pr privileged and thank you so much for making us think, yes, we'll do the next one now. And a big thank you to Dan and Alison for sharing and for Sarah doing this last minute, sort of pulling it all together. I'd love to stay on here and continue chatting, but... I know I had very strict instructions to keep it till four. If anyone wants to give us any feedback personally, please do feel free to email us um, and any thoughts they will be gratefully received. And thank you so much all and please stay safe and enjoy the sun. Thanks, Alan. Thank you. Oh, I'm going to stay here to see you all say bye. It's nice. Bye. Sarah, Dan, Alison. Bye. Stay on, just debrief. Bye all. It's lovely to see your faces and the connected. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Zoe, thanks for contributing. You're welcome. Great job, guys. See you soon. A couple of weeks. Look forward to it. Zoe, that was lovely, yours. Yeah. Really nice. Oh, you're welcome. Hi, Suzanne. <laughs> see so many familiar faces on here it's so moving so, here. so lovely <laughs> don't you'll set me off but thanks for being on the chat Suzanne that's really great <laughs> Suzanne and Tim hello Suzanne hi hi isn't that nice to think we've got three more sessions as well together I love that and, and I'm thinking past that and let's do a monthly series Suzanne oh, are you really oh Suzanne. think big Helen that's great Helen, if you want help, call me. Oh, we will indeed. Sarah's like going, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> See you, Zoe. Bye, I'm going to go. Bye, bye. Okay. Thanks, Zoe.
Okay, you're going to collect the checks, oh, yeah. are you? Oh, yeah. Okay. You yeah, so we'll keep we'll com we'll keep um the chat. So we'll when we send out the recordings, we'll equally have the chat function as well. And then at the end of the series, we're going to put it all together in a bit of a image that yeah, yeah. all the themes. Lovely. Lovely. Jan, how did you felt that landed? Yeah, that was great. Can can you hear me? All right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, because there is yeah there is this little sign here. Uh, right. So, uh, yeah, I, I found it very good. Uh, it was uh, quite clear. Um, I, it, it gave me a, an idea for uh, in my uh, session three. Um, and I would like to use the metaphor of the half, the glass half empty, half full in a completely different way. But, but I'll, I'll show you that on session three. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> I, I very much look forward to it. It uh, I found it, uh, uh, that you did a great job. It's an honor to be part of the uh, series. Thank you very much, Jan. Now we've got some really good material here for you know what, haven't we? Well, I definitely do. <laughs> Especially on reframing and the. Um, the way we had the virus from a personal point of view. I think Alison's stuff on about guilt and fear has been really good on that. Thank you. Um, really powerful. And you, what's more of your poetry, Jan? Say again? More of your poetry. Yeah, you want to hear more of my poetry? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe in session three. You never know. <laughs> never know. Yes. Well done, guys. Thank you very much. Okay, I have to go. Take care and uh, see you next time. See you. Thank Take you. care. Oh, Daniel, Daniel, just one, one little question. Uh, or Helen, Helen, you referred to the next session starting one hour earlier. Is that just for the second one or is that all the other sessions? Just for the second. Just for the second, one hour early. Okay. Yeah. Just to, with the time zone difference. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It will be. Two o'clock UK time, but three o'clock Belgian time. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll make a note of that in my agenda. Okay. Thank you, Jan. Thank you, Jan. Bye. 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 There, I'm conscious there's still people on here. Can we end it or not? Can we just carry on talking just as a bit of a wrap up? Naz, you can. can on, if we can stop recording at this point. Yeah, good point.